Welcome to the Wealth Stream Podcast. The team at Hightower Great Lakes share their insights and passions for empowering their clients to live their best life. In this energetic podcast, we will take you on a journey to help you navigate your financial future, overcome life's challenges to reach your financial goals, and find the financial clarity you've been searching for. Let's explore the downstream impact of your wealth and what it means to you, your family, and your community to live greater. Hello and welcome to The Wealth Stream with Tim Scannell from Hightower Great Lakes. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm doing well, Eric. How are you doing today? I'm excited. I know you've got a guest. Exactly. And that is Susan Galotli of Bench Strength Coaching. And she's on the line with us right now. Hello, Susan. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Really happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Tim, I I know that you brought Susan on the show for a very specific reason. I'm just going to hand this over because I know you're going to kind of go through a little bit of what your process is and how Susan kind of fits into that with everything that you do with your clients. And and I know it's going to be a great conversation today. So, so, uh, Doug, there's another point. So thank you so much for bringing her on today. Excellent. Yeah. So as I've talked in the past, Eric, on these podcasts, we have a, I think, a unique wealth management formula. Like a lot of advisors, we focus on investment management. Uh, we also get into the advanced planning processes like wealth transfer, wealth protection, charitable giving. Uh, but one of the things I th- we focus on that I believe differentiates us is our focus on working with the professional team. Or we call it relationship management. Uh, what we like to do is get involved with our clients' other professionals, CPAs, attorneys, trust officers, insurance agents. But, but oftentimes we run into situations where we need to expand um, the team, uh, go out and mm-hmm. get resources. So skill sets that are needed. And when we do that, uh, we call it, we call it a virtual family office. And Eric, I have done with you a previous podcasts where we talked about like uh, episode 15 and 16, we got into more detail about the family office services. And mm-hmm. in episode 28, we talked I called it the living your your optimal financial world, which really got into a lot of details about the virtual family office and you know the expanded professional network. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on that today. But what I wanted to do is bring Susan on because Susan is a tremendous resource for the high net worth clients, entrepreneurs, business owners uh, beyond the traditional CPA, attorney, trust officer, insurance specialist that a lot of my clients, a lot of the listeners might be thinking about. So I just wanted to first make a quick introduction and say hello to Susan. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Tim. Sure. And um, we are doing this remotely because we are all still in the social distancing world in May. Um, so Susan's out in Seattle, um, and I'm still <laughs> located here in beautiful Northwest Indiana. Um, but Susan, I just thought I would start out, if you don't mind, just telling me a little bit about yourself, you know, as the founder of Bench Strength, Bench Strength Coaching, um, and tell me a little bit about what you do. So I worked at the Boeing company for a long time. I was an IT exec there, and we did a lot of development, obviously, of our people. And after a while, I just decided I needed a change, and I really wanted to delve into that. And I joined, a, or I, I took a certification for coaching, And there I met two other women. Obviously, I met a lot of people, but I met a couple other women who also wanted to start a company. And so the three of us started what we call Bench Strength Coaching. And the name really came from our interest in developing future leaders and looking at what we call the bench in corporate America or who's on your succession plans. And so we have this huge interest in saying, we we keep hearing about people that want to be developed, companies want to develop future leaders, but they never quite get around to it. And we wanted to do that. So we started this company. Of course, we have to have other services too. So in addition to helping succession plans, and that's what ties into this conversation, kind of developing future leaders of family-owned businesses. Uh, But we also do executive coaching, and then we have a women's uh, program for future leaders uh, of young women, and that's been pretty successful too. 
I've read a little bit about that. Can you talk a little bit about that, the program you have for women? Sure. So again, all three of, or my two other partners were all women. We, we lived in corporate America and we knew that there were some challenges that we faced. And of course, with all of the recent you know, Me Too and, and just the data about women uh, moving up in higher levels of management, we really wanted to share our experiences. And we had some things that we knew if we had been told sooner, we would have made different choices, if you will, or different decisions. And those really are choices about our behavior. And so we, we talked to those very candidly with these women. And and some of it is around socialization, especially in in uh, the United States, how we what we socialize women to do and how we interact among ourselves in a social world that is very different than what the business world uh, requires. And so we want to be really candid with women in their 30s about some of these habits they may have formed that could get in their way as they go up the corporate ladder or, or just into leadership roles anywhere, not even just corporate America, but in your own business even. So we've, we've had tremendous success with it. Uh, the women that have gone through it are just, they are so grateful for the opportunity to really explore these things that they've been doing and not really understanding how they were getting in their way. Yeah, that, no, it's amazing. I, like I said, I read about it and I just think it's amazing the work you got, you're doing. In fact, for the listener, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful, I should say, to have Susan here is, you know, when I have worked with families, especially as it relates to succession planning, generational wealth planning, it seems to me, based on my experience and everything we read, that, you know, transparency and commun- lack of communication often, uh, lack, of, lack of role definition, lack of a bench preparation has been, is a big issue that creates problems. And, you know, recently, Susan helped draft an article that we're going to be uh, posting on our website, and uh, it's 10 considerations for gifting shared properties. And we're kind of shifting into that right now because a lot of the skill sets, Susan, you have uh, through all the different things you've done, have I think have really, it's been incredible as you started telling me about this project you worked on with your family and you ended up coming up with this um, outline and this, this. so it, it, without rambling too much about it, I wanted to kind of talk about that in particular and how the skill sets you have have really helped um, kind of help your family get through some gifting issues in your family. Yeah, that sounds great. As I was thinking about this, Tim, and, you know, stop me if you have a question, but I I thought maybe it would be helpful to just set a little background and provide some context of of how this happened, if, if that makes sense. Perfect. And so what I, what I thought about is back in 1930, my great grandfather bought and built a, a, we call it the cabin. So he built the cabin on a beautiful piece of property. And that cabin goes down through the family. And eventually it ends up with my father and his three brothers. And in about the 1960s, uh, kind of the mid sixties or whatever, my father's three brothers want to sell. And my dad doesn't, but my dad isn't in a position to buy all of them out. So he takes on a partner. So now it's my dad and this other family. And it is still, um, our two families own this property. Um, in maybe the mid, or no, probably it was around the late 1980s, uh, maybe even the early 90s, my parents gift their portion of this property to me and my siblings, and I have four siblings. So that's how we came to have this, and we still have these partners. So you can imagine there's a lot of dynamics with this. Sure. There's nothing, yeah. th- there's nothing written down. My parents, they have no agreement. They have a handshake with this other family. And as it evolves, my family, you know, we kind of consider it our cabin. Now, that's a little absurd given that they've been in it since, you know, the 60s. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's an interesting dynamic to even think about that our family sort of calls it our family. 
And, uh, and yet we've had partners for what, 60 years. So wow. And how many, how many people are involved in it? Well, like how um, many partners? Yeah. So now there are, there are six people of my generation involved still, mm-hmm. but it took us a little while to get there because so what, it, what then, what then kind of came about is in the, the late 1990s, maybe it was even early 2000s, one of my siblings, my sister, she wanted to get out. And honestly, I feel kind of bad about this. Uh, we didn't really know what to do. And so I, I think, and, and if I just think of myself, I don't know that I really knew why she needed out or even that she really wanted out. She loved it, everybody. So, all I can say is what I did, which was kind of ignore it um, for the most part. And then, then what happened? Okay, so now I'm going to get to the part where, you know, we're, we're really kind of talking about sure. how, how I start to use some of these skills. Um, you know, well into my career, I've done a lot of coaching, deciding that I'm going to become a coach. So it's around 2013, 14 or something that I really start to realize this is very difficult for my sister to stay a part of. And when you own just a sliver of a family property, it can be difficult to evaluate or to value what that piece is. And Mm -hmm. everybody's got kind of an opinion about how you ought to value it. And of course it could be very difficult to sell. So you could almost argue it's worth nothing. So usually, so what, what the remedy can be sometimes for people in that situation is to just say, well, we can't figure it out, so we're going to sell the whole thing so I get my piece. Now, thank goodness my sister didn't do that. Um, I'm very, very close to my sister, and I start to realize we have to find a way to help mm-hmm. her, you know, to help her get out of this. we got to help help do this. So I decide I have to help become her advocate. And this is, this is something that happens in all kinds of business interactions and stuff. There's a voice out there that people aren't hearing. And in families, that dynamic is even more complicated because, you know, we grow up with these siblings and we have all this history with them, some of it good, some of it not so good, and we can hang on to our feelings about those for a long, long time. And you can see families that get back together and everybody falls back into their, you know, eight-year-old role. Mm. So that's a dynamic that's going on. And I, I decide that, you know, I got to really advocate and go to my siblings and say, you know, we, we need to find a way. Now, yeah, because I imagine historically, uh, or I should say in the past, you had your father, the other family, there might have been two people making the decisions. And now, You've got all these other people involved, and I guess one of the questions I would have is, you know, I imagine you spent a lot of time with everybody, as opposed to top down dictating what's going to happen. You know, I'd be interested as you as you talk about this, how you draw out uh, from each of the parties involved what they wanted, what the impact on their family might be, et cetera. Because I imagine that took a lot of time and a lot of effort. Yeah, it well, it did, and. Um, I was aided by some things and then hindered by some other things. So, uh, so the first thing that happened is, is, you know, I was talking to my sister a lot and I started to really get an appreciation for all the things she had done to make it financially viable for her to stay in and pay her dues and the toll that it was kind of taking on her emotionally. And, and so once I heard that, I started to realize, you know, as I said, that I need to be your advocate. I just started calling my siblings and, it, and we would always have to talk about the cabin at different times, you know, who's going to be using it? What are the dues? And I just started interjecting at, you know, different times. Hey, you guys, Emily really, um, needs to sell. We got to think about that. Uh, I don't think we've given it a fair hearing. What you know? What what are the objections to figuring that out? So we start these conversations, and I 
I'm still working full time. So it's not like it's my sole purpose. And truly that's, that served us all well is that these things take time and people have to, um, like, like, like many things that you want to change, you know, people need time to adjust, to think about it, to have their own reaction, and then maybe a place to talk. And so I then just was doing that. I would call my siblings maybe about other stuff and, uh, you know, because I talked to all of them. And so, uh, but, but I would always bring it up or, or at opportune times, bring it up. Well, we're going to have to help, you know, guy, what are you thinking? Uh, so we, so I was doing that, but then a couple other things started to come along that, that actually added to the dynamic, helped the dynamic and challenged it. And that is, I also, um, when I left Boeing and became a coach, I was spending some time at the cabin and it was in a state of, it really needed a major remodel. I mean, sure. we needed to, to take it down to its studs. We weren't going to change outside. And I was selfish in that I had been advocating for that too, but all of a sudden now I had a little more time on my hands and I really started to advocate hard for that. I started getting people to come give us bids. What was it going to take? Um, you know, talking to architects, talking to designers. And I say it was selfish because I have four children myself and they want to use it. And I wanted to use it a lot. And I would go up there and I started to realize, you know, if you grew up going here, you would think this place was cool. But if you were my friend of five years and the first time you saw this place, you might kind of go, oh, yeah, well, it's kind of a cabin. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, different perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, anyway, it just, so all of a sudden now I want a huge investment and I want, I'm advocating for you guys. We really got to remodel it. We got to redo the plumbing and the, everybody wants it. We've got all these, right? Now we've got all these new family members. I have four kids. So the next generation, 18. So, wow. you know, we, we talked about it. Mine, six that are kind of influencing, want to have an opinion. The next generation, 18. That is a mm. lot of people and it's not really manageable. I mean, six is hard. 18 is right. crazy. Yeah. So I imagine you had to deal with it before it got to the 18. <laughs> yes. So, so now we want, so now I'm advocating really hard. And, and again, I, I say this selfishly because it, it was benefiting everybody. I think everybody else wanted it too, but I was willing to do the work and I was willing to have all the tough conversations with everybody. You know, what's it going to take? How much do we need? How do we get? Everybody would agree that they can do this. One of my siblings is a lawyer. He, he doesn't practice law. He doesn't, but, but he's a lawyer by training. And he, uh, so he took on sort of that role and we, we appointed somebody to be our family representative to the other family for the remodel. But I did all the work of the remodel. I did all of the negotiating in terms of who we would talk to and with all of my siblings. You know, what do you think of this color scheme? Oh, I need you guys to do that. And um, so we had that dynamic that was helpful. And in that, we decided we had to do this operating agreement. Wow. And that, right? So now we've added this third thing. We got to write this all down. And by this time, just as we're starting to do the operating agreement, we've had success among the four of us help getting help getting my sister selling, buying her out in a way that, you know, worked probably as well as you could ever imagine it would work. And, you know, we used advisors like yourself um, to help us in some legal advice on how do we evaluate the property and give her a fair price, but take into consideration that it's difficult to sell a sliver of a family owned property. And so, All of those things were playing and it just became clear that I was the person that sort of had the, the capability to talk to everybody and then listen. And can I ask you about that? Because I think what is unique is in most families, most businesses I work with when we're, you know, when we, I do research and talk to other advisors, uh, it's often 
it's hard if you can find a family member who has the time but also the skill set to devote to that. So <laughs> is that something you recommend other people do or did it just work out because you had the, the skill sets needed? I'm just wanting to get your opinion on that. I think that families that successfully uh, work through this, and I, I know there are others that have, they have somebody like me and they don't even necessarily know it uh, as a conscious skill set. Uh, but I think a lot of families that can't make it work, it's because they need somebody like me. Somebody sure. who, you know, absolutely has the time, but not just time, and it is a lot of time. It's really the interest and the willingness to hear people out and then the reason it's a coach is because it's helping them nudge them in their own self-awareness about why do they want something the way it is? What, you know, and then finding ways that you can honor their need and yet maybe move them off of getting specifically what they wanted. Yeah, that sounds very hard. <laughs> well, it can be. It, it's time consuming and you have to have a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And that's what just most people don't have. They're busy with their own lives. They're busy in their own jobs. They don't enjoy it. Um, maybe they have a sibling that drives them nuts. They listen to him for three minutes. And so I'll, I'll give some, I'll give some of just my family dynamics that could be helpful. Sure. Um, I have a sibling that really is very, very detail oriented, thinks out loud and really needs to talk it all through everything everything. I mean, from seriously, like where you're going to place the garbage can in the kitchen to what kind of overall paint color you're going to use. And that is difficult. It's really difficult for a lot of people. And, and in, in earlier years, it probably would have been difficult for me, but I just started to realize like that, that's how you get people to come around to, um, being able to honor it. Sometimes they just need to talk about it and say it, and then they can let it go. Sometimes you need to have little ceremonies. You know, let's all go up. I mean, we had, we, we, I, I pulled everybody together and said, this is a weekend. Everybody comes, only family, although uh, we did have one spouse come uh, in the end. Um, but we had suggested no spouses, and we went through everything, and we, we marked it. This has, you know, deep, meaningful significance to somebody it goes in one in one you know sort of category these are things we got to get rid of all this stuff and then this we actually need and we're going to use and so that we could set aside some of those things that nobody really or most people really didn't want but somebody really wanted and so we didn't just go from uh nope got to decide today throw it out which is what you know four of us would have done to Oh, wow. You really love that. Okay. Great. Let's put it over here and let's look at it and let's think about it. And then, you know, we'll come back to it and we'll give you time to think about it. You know, maybe you want to take it home. Maybe, maybe you just need to say your farewell to it and it needs to go into kind of this holding pattern before you can let it go. So I, that was one sibling. I have another sibling that is driven by business. I mean, literally everything is business. It's amazing. And you know, very quick to make decisions. So you can imagine that that's kind of a different. So slowing that down a little and and helping them be self-aware about the impact that it's having on others. And so that one driven by business could, you know, go through the sort of ranting and raving, if you want to call it that. that that's not fair, really. But the their process of, oh my God, really? We're going to go through everything? We're going to talk about, you know, paint colors? <laughs> sure. Or, you know, what knob we're going to put on. Like, I just can't do it and be like, okay, well, don't, don't come to that part. You don't right, really, if you don't really be, care, think, yeah. Yeah. you know, don't come because mm -hmm. it's just going to drive you nuts. And yet we're not going to get there if we don't honor the person who needs to do it that way. Right. And so uh, how long did the whole process take from start to finish? Do you think? Yeah. Well, uh, about four years start to finish. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. And, but you know, there were, major milestones. I mean, in that, you know, it probably took just about a year to do the selling of, uh, for my sister's piece. So that was, mm -hmm. that was a really big, 
milestone and stepping stone. The remodel took a couple years, like most remodels do, um, you know, and we came in like literally on budget, literally on budget. I think we were like a thousand dollars shy of the actual number and we worked our tails off and I did, but it was listening to all that. And then this operating agreement. Oh my goodness. That has been very, because that, that's the most difficult. Uh, and that is where you really, uh, have to look at why do people want this agreement? What are we trying to achieve with it? And that's mm -hmm. where you have to really have like understanding of financials, right? So again, back to your expertise. Yeah. And, and so I would say like in, for me working with business owners with generational wealth management, it seems like you were able to accomplish it. Uh, you were able to make it work. You certainly have the skill sets and you, you invested the time. I think oftentimes, uh, clients, they don't, families, businesses don't. Oftentimes when you still maybe have a strong, uh, founder, strong patriarch, you may, you know, people in charge, uh, there's might even be more issues. So, um, what would you, if you, what would you recommend? Uh, how would you recommend, I should say, somebody, a firm, a company, you know, one of our clients, the listeners, um, access your skill set um, and work with you in situations they might have and take advantage of some of the experience and skills you have? They certainly could just call me personally. My phone number is 425-505-1891. Or they can shoot me an email at susan at benchdrinkcoaching.com and any one of those ways. And how I would, how I would say is that the reason they would want to reach out to, or, or you would want to suggest they reach out to us is that, as you said, often entrepreneurs uh, who start their own business, they are pretty hard charging. They know how to get stuff done. They're savvy with business. They've had to make a lot of tough decisions. Uh, they've had to kind of probably s scrape and fight a little bit to, to make their company work. And that creates a personality type. If they're going to pass that on to family members, they may not have family members that have all of those same characteristics. That doesn't make them not as good a leader. It just makes them a different kind of leader. But human behavior is what it is. And we tend to think somebody should be like us because we know we made it work. So sometimes uh, the patriarch, as you will, or the matriarch of the, or the owner of the business needs to kind of be able to step back and look at how others might lead. And then also to be very candid about what the skill set is that their you know, children do possess and what might they be missing and how would you go about giving them opportunities or experiences. And what a coach can do is really help the leader and or the children to step back and, and try to be a little more objective about what do I really know they can do and give that space where you can say the things you want to say about your children or about your father or about your sister uh, or brother or whatever, and then be like, okay, now that I said that, you know, it's sort of irrelevant. <laughs> right. But sometimes we need to say it. And that's what, yeah. that's what the coach can do is because often we can't say that to our sibling without it creating tension or, or we're not going to go say that to our parent, you know? Yeah. And, and it'll also probably stretch out the, the whole time it takes. And so I'm, I agree with you 100%. I'm a firm believer in bringing in experts to help. And I, I really believe the things you do can help all family owned businesses, um, work through success and issues, long term generational planning, et cetera. So like one thing, um, I really liked you put together a blog or a report called the 10 considerations for gifting shared properties. And, uh, for the listeners that will be on our website, I know it's also on your website too. Um, but I, I strongly encourage people interested, uh, and I know we're going to recommend to some of our clients connect with you. But I strongly recommend people who are interested um, reach out and connect with you because I, I think you can add a lot of lot of value that to be part of a team. We would would love that and 
really appreciate you working with us and supporting our efforts. And of course, we want to do whatever we can to send clients your way if we run into them. Perfect. Um, so Eric? Absolutely. I, I, I love this. This is fantastic. Susan, you were speaking directly to me when you were talking about you know, the, uh, your sibling that really didn't care about the paint color. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, yes. my, my wife and I have been married for 25 years and I had to realize many years ago that when she asked my opinion about color schemes and things like that, knowing full well that I'm partially colorblind, that it's not that she really wants my opinion. She just wants to talk out loud about it. And she wants to include me in a decision, even though I have no opinion, right? <laughs> she just wants right. to hear me say, oh, well, that, that one looks pretty good to me, I guess. And maybe you, you make the decision. And then she's happy because she just needs to talk it through. I used to just say, you know I'm colorblind. Why would you ask me these questions, right? But I had to learn, no, it's, it's not about what I have as an opinion necessarily. She just wants to talk out loud about it and talk it through. So uh, yeah, that was perfect. I, I love the fact that you brought that one up specifically because I was just chuckling to myself. Yeah, well, it took me about 15 <laughs> years to learn that one uh, into my marriage. So, but it's made And that's probably smoother. fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it is crazy how we think that it's – you know, we just see the world so much from our own perspective. And, and uh, yeah, family dynamics are really, really interesting. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much for being on your wonderful Thank guest, you. Tim. Thank you so much for bringing her on the show. Oh, my pleasure. This has been great. Yeah, absolutely. And lastly, to you, the audience, I want to thank you for listening to the Wealth Stream Podcast with Tim Scannell. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Tim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Hightower Great Lakes, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Stream Podcast. We hope you gained some valuable insight that you can apply to your life and share with others. Please don't forget to subscribe below to be notified when new episodes become available. And don't forget to live greater. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Hightower Great Lakes. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Hightower Great Lakes is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors LLC.